Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read uh, The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. So, let's get going. <clears throat> if I went, I should see your mother as well as Dickon, said Mary, thinking it over and liking the idea very much. She doesn't seem to be like the mothers in India. Her work in the garden and the excitement of the afternoon ended by making her feel quiet and thoughtful. Martha stayed with her until tea time, but they sat in comfortable quiet and talked very little. But just before Martha went downstairs for the tea tray, Mary asked a question. Martha, she said, has the scullery maid had the toothache again today? Martha certainly started slightly. What makes thee ask that? she said. Cause, because when I waited so long for you to come back, I opened the door and walked down the corridor to see if you were coming, and I heard that far off crying again, just as we heard it the other night. There isn't a wind today, so you, so you see it couldn't have been the wind. Eh, said Martha restlessly, I mustn't go walking about in corridors and listening. Mr. Craven would be that there angry, there's no knowing what he'd do. I wasn't listening, said Mary. I was just waiting for you, and I heard it. That's three times. My word. There's Mrs. Medlock's bell, said Martha, and she almost ran out of the room. It's the strangest house anyone ever lived in, said Mary drowsily, as she dropped her head on the cushioned seat of the armchair near her. Fresh air and digging and skipping rope had made her feel so comfortably tired that she fell asleep. Chapter 10 Dickon The sun shone down for nearly a week on the secret garden. The secret garden was what Mary called it when she was thinking of it. She liked the name, and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut her in, no one knew where she was. It seemed almost like being shut out of the world in some fairy place. The few books she had read and liked had been fairy story books, and she had read of secret gardens in some of the stories. Sometimes people went to sleep in them for a hundred years, which she had thought must be rather stupid. She had no intention of going to sleep, and, in fact, she was becoming wider awake every day which passed at Misselthwaite. She was beginning to like to be out of, the, out of doors. She no longer hated the wind, but she enjoyed it. She could run faster and longer, and she could skip up at to a hundred. The bulbs in the secret garden must have been much astonished. Such nice clear places were made round them that they had all the breathing space they wanted. And really, if Mistress Mary had known it, they began to cheer up under the dark earth and work tremendously. The sun could get at them and warm them, and when the rain came down, it could reach them at once, so they began to feel very much alive. Mary was an odd, determined little person, and now she had something interesting to be determined about, she was very much absorbed indeed. She worked and dug and pulled up weeds steadily, only becoming more pleased with her work every hour instead of tiring of it. It seemed to her like a fascinating sort of play. She found many more of the sprouting pale green points than she had ever hoped to find. They seemed to be starting up everywhere, and each day she was sure she found tiny new ones, some so tiny that they ba barely peeped above the earth. There were so many that she remembered what Martha had said about the snowdrops by the thousands, and about bulbs spreading and making new ones. These had been left to themselves for ten years, and perhaps they had spread, like the snowdrops, into thousands. She wondered how long it would be before they showed that they were flowers. Sometimes she stopped digging to look at the garden and tried to imagine what it would be like when it was covered with thousands of lovely things in bloom. During that week of sunshine, she became, became more intimate with Ben Weatherstaff. She surprised him several times by seeming to start up beside him, as if she sprang out of the earth. The truth was that she was afraid that he would pick up his tools and go away if he saw her coming, so she always walked toward him as silently as possible. 
but in fact he did not object to her as strongly as he had at first. Perhaps he was secretly rather flattered by her evident desire for his elderly company. Then, also, she was more civil than she had been. He did, not, he did not know that when she first saw him, she spoke to him as she would have spoken to a native, and had not known that a cross, sturdy old Yorkshire man was not accustomed to, to salaam to his masters, and be merely commanded by them to do things. Thou art like the what robin, he said to her one morning when he lifted his head and saw her standing by him. I never knows when I shall see thee or which side thou'll come from. He's friends with me now, said Mary. That's like him, said and snapped Ben Weatherstaff. Making up to women folk just for vanity and fl flightiness. There's nothing he wouldn't do for its sake of showing off and flirting his tail feathers. He's full of pride is, uh, as a, an egg's full of meat. He very seldom talked much, and sometimes did not even answer Mary's questions except by a grunt. But this morning he said more than usual. He stood up and rested one hobnailed boot on top of his spade, while he looked her over. "'How long has they been here?' he jerked out. "'I think it's about a month,' she answered. "'I was beginning to do Misselthwaite credit,' he said. "'There's a bit fatter than there was, and that there's not quite so yellow. "'They looked like a young plucked crow when the first came into this garden.' Thinks I to myself, I never set eyes on an uglier, sourer-faced young'un. Mary was not vain, and as she had never thought much of her looks, she was not greatly disturbed. I know I'm fatter, she said. My stockings are getting tighter. They used to make wrinkles. There's the robin, Ben Weatherstaff. There indeed was the robin, and she thought he looked nicer than ever. His red waistcoat was as glossy as satin, and he flirted his wings and tail and tilted his head and hopped about with all sorts of lively graces. He seemed determined to make Ben Weatherstaff admire him. But Ben was sarcastic. Aye, there thou art, he said. They can put up with me for a bit sometimes when there's got no one better. There's been reddening up thy waistcoat and polishing thy feathers this two weeks. I know what there's up to. There's caught in some bold young madam somewhere telling the lies to her about being the finest cock robin on Missile Moor, and ready to fight all the rest of them. Oh, look at him, exclaimed Mary. The robin was evidently in a fascinating, bold mood. He hopped closer and closer and looked at Ben Weatherstaff more and more engagingly. He flew on to the nearest current bush and tilted his head and sang a little song right at him. I thinks they'll get one over me by doing that, said Ben, wrinkling his face up in such a, ro such a way that Mary felt sure he was trying not to look pleased. Thou thinks no one can stand out against thee. That's what thou thinks. The robin spread his wings. Mary could scarcely believe her eyes. He flew right up to the handle of Ben Weatherstaff's spade and alighted on top of it. Then the old man's face wrinkled itself slowly into a new expression. He stood still, as if he were afraid to breathe, as if he would not have stirred for the world, lest his robin should start away. He spoke quite in a whisper. Well, I'm danged, he said, as softly as if he were saying something quite different. That does know how to get at that a, a chap, that does. As fair unearthly as not so knowing. And with that, I'm not going to read another page, I'm afraid. I'll take it as a wee bit too long. <clears throat> but I am starting to uh, quite like this Secret Garden book. I'm also finding uh, Ben Weatherstaff's accent far easier to handle than um, some of the other accents in some of the other books. Uh, it's definitely more normal to me, that's for sure. Um, so reading that is far easier, I find, than uh, uh, than some of the others. That's for certain. Uh, where I've definitely struggled. This one is much, much more plain to me. Anyway, I will say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, or night. 
no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.